Hello, friend. I'm Marcy Farrell from Thankful Homemaker, and I'm so glad to be with you today. Thank you for being here with me. We are continuing through the Sermon on the Mount. Again, I always say so slowly, but we're working through it. And today we're going to be working through Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 24. And it was that the, today's video is titled, Where is Your Treasure? And if you're just joining me here for the first time, welcome. I am so glad that you are here. And if you're wondering why a YouTube channel called Thankful Homemaker is studying through the Sermon on the Mount and not just talking about homemaking, which I do, um, there are many past videos and I hope to get more future ones coming soon. But the reason we work through God's word is because I know personally the impact it has on my heart and life and how I go about caring for my family and my home when I'm rightly understanding who God is and in light of who God is what he requires of me as his redeemed daughter. Anyone can learn how to manage a home and all that's involved, right? But only those of us in Christ, those of us who have been redeemed, who have repented of our sins and put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, can truly manage a home in a way that honors the Lord. And that's my hope here, to always give you gospel-driven encouragement as you care for your home and family. And today in our time together, I pray that we get a better understanding of how to enjoy God's good, good gifts to us and how to build up treasure in heaven and how to increase in our love and faith and Christ-like character. Because as we are being sanctified and becoming more like Jesus, it's going to change how we interact with those in our homes and our churches and how we care for what the Lord has entrusted to us on this earth as we live our lives here as sojourners, I'm going to get that out of my way, and exiles awaiting his return. So I pray our time that it gives you a desire to increase in knowledge of the Lord. And again, not just for the sake of gaining knowledge, but to truly be transformed more and more into the image of Jesus. That's always my hope here. So I know that was a long introduction, but I feel sometimes that I need to share a refresher to us all and especially to anyone who is new here with me today. So the last several Sermon on the Mount episodes had us working through a section in Matthew chapter 6 on we did on not being a hypocrite, and we worked through then we worked through giving and prayer and fasting. Jesus was dealing with our private Christian life, and now he's addressing our public life and our issues with the world. In stating the world, okay, we're we're not talking about the physical world, but, but, but more in terms of worldly ambition and how we can be drawn into the thinking of the world's ways. So let me read our text for today, and we're going to start digging in. And as always, I'm reading from the ESV version, and this is Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 24, and it begins, Do not light up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So our passage today is still continuing with the theme that our righteousness as believers must exceed that of scribes and Pharisees. Their view was of an earthly kingdom. Their view taught that wealth meant God's blessing. Hmm, does that sound familiar? From the false teaching of the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. Do not get caught up in that. If you have any questions or concerns of a teacher or someone you're following as part of that, I know um, Michelle Leslie, I don't know if it's michellelesley.com or .org. I'll I'll link to um, her in the show notes. And also Justin Peters Ministries are two good ones if you're not clear to look up and make sure that a teacher you're following is solid. They, they, They go through false teachers and do such a good job of that and give links and all kinds of um, evidence so you can see where the, what the false teaching is there. So it's not just calling people out to call people out. They are truly calling out false teachers. And that's important that we do not get caught up in that. So, and um, 
let me continue on with that. But again, the health, wealth, prosperity gospel, it is it is a false teaching, and you need to stay away from that if you are part of that. I call you out to do that, please. So being in Christ, we now look at our possessions in such a different way. And I, I hope that as we walk through this together today, that that's going to come clear to all of us. So verse Matthew 6, 19 reads, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. Do not is pretty clear <laughs> that Jesus is forbidding us to do this. He isn't forbidding having wealth or possessions or saving for retirement or providing for our family. We know the verses in Proverbs 6, 6 through 8 that praise the ant for storing summer food he'll need in winter. And we know in Timothy that we're to provide for our own families. First Timothy 5, 8 tells us, as always, the scripture references I mentioned to you, they're going to be in the show notes, and that is linked below the video. If you visit the main show notes at my blog, all the links will be there for you. But what he is forbidding here is a selfishly accumulating goods. So this does not just concern the wealthy because it says, quote, treasures and not do not lay up for yourselves, just quote, money. Money is part of our treasures, but Jesus is also concerned here about our attitude towards our possessions. Martin Lloyd-Jones stated, he said, our Lord is dealing here with people who get their main or even total satisfaction in this life from things that belong to this world only. There are so many earthly treasures that we can get caught up in when we forget that we are sojourners and exiles on this earth. We can treasure our family and they are a good thing, but it's a problem when we look to them as everything. When they become idols in our lives, we can treasure our standing in society or the accomplishments of our children or the position in our workplaces. All of these things we can't take with us when we die. They are temporal and not eternal. Job 121 stated, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return. So the word Jesus uses here to not lay up earthly treasures, they're a command and not an option. And we need to clarify what the text is not saying. The Bible is not condemning the possession of having private property. The Eighth Commandment tells us you shall not steal in Exodus 20.15. So we're not to take things belonging to another person, and they're not to take the things that belong to us. We know the story of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5, 3 through 4. I'm going to read those couple of verses there. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. So it's clear here from what Peter is stating that they were allowed to have private property and God doesn't force on us on how to dispose of it. Their lying was an issue. And I'm going to address that a little here, but I, I want to quote Warren Wiersbe on these verses in Acts because it convicted me and I thought you could use some conviction too. I'm always just trying to continue to spur us on here to love and good deeds. But Warren Wiersbe stated, he said, it's really easy for us to condemn Ananias and Sapphira for their dishonesty, but we need to examine our own lives to see if our profession is backed up by our practice. Do we really mean everything that we pray about in public? Do we sing the hymns and gospel songs sincerely or routinely? He quotes Matthew 15, 8. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. If God killed, quote, religious deceivers today, how many church members would be left, end quote there. So Jesus did say to the rich young ruler in Matthew 19 to give up all his possessions. But do note, Jesus didn't say that to, to Mary or Martha or Lazarus. But Jesus was making clear here to the rich young ruler that he was breaking the two greatest commandments. He did not love the Lord with all his heart, and he did not love his neighbor as himself. He loved himself and his money more. The rich young ruler stated that he kept all the commandments, but Jesus is bringing him to the point of seeing himself as a sinner, and Jesus is using the law to do it. James Montgomery Boyce helps us out in understanding this a bit more. It's, he states, he says, it doesn't lie in abstinence or withdrawal. It lies in the proper use and proper estimate of the things which God has proved. In other words, we are not called upon to relinquish things, but rather use them under God's direction. We're to use them for the health and well-being of our family, for material aid to others, and for the great task of proclaiming the gospel and promoting Christian principles. 
John MacArthur stated on this passage a story about John Wesley. He said, he said, during his exceptionally long ministry, which spanned most of the 18th century, John Wesley earned a considerable amount of money from his published sermons and other works. Yet he only left 28 pounds when he died because he continually gave what he earned to the Lord's work. He continues, he said, it's right to provide for our families and to make reasonable plans for the future, to make wise investments and to have money to carry on a business, to give to the poor, to support the Lord's work. It's being, he states, dishonest, greedy, covetous, stingy, and miserly about possessions. That is wrong. To honestly earn, save, and give, that's wise and good. To hoard and spend only on ourselves not only is unwise, but it's sinful, end quote there. So when we think of where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, it's a reminder to us that there's no security in material things. They can be gone in an instant. Our security lies when we lay up treasures in heaven. We need to major on the internals and not the externals. Jim Elliott's quote comes to mind here. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. So we need to guard our hearts against materialism. We need to be aware of the needs around us and use what the Lord has given us to do good to others and help those in need to provide for our families. And we need to remember to live in light of the fact that this world is not our home. One commentator stated it very simply. I love this. Hold tightly to what is eternal and hold lightly to what is temporal. So the body of missionary David Livingstone was buried in England where he was born, but his heart was buried in the Africa he loved. At the foot of a small tree in a small African village, the natives dug a hole and placed in it the heart of this man whom they loved and respected. So I want to turn this to us, and I, I know this story sounds a little grim, but this is just a good picture. So there was an unknown quote where, and I'm, I'm going to assume they were referring to this quote. I don't know that, but it just fits. They said, if your heart were to be buried in the place you loved most during life, where would it be? In your pocketbook? In an appropriate space down at the office? Where is your heart? I think that's just a good question to ask ourselves on a regular basis. Matthew 6, 20 states, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. John Wesley stated, he said, the real value of a thing is the price it will bring in eternity. So our reality is we are all storing up treasures, but are we doing it here on earth or in heaven? And what does it practically look like to do this? Ray Pritchard stated it. He said, you store up treasures in heaven by investing your money in things that will last for eternity. And two things last forever, the word of God and people. Matthew 24, 35 reminds us, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And 1 John 2, 17 states, the world is passing away and also it's lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. So the best investment that we can make is investing our lives in the word of God and to people. Matthew 6, 21 states, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. John MacArthur, in his commentary on Matthew, stated, he said, Jesus goes on to point out that a person's cherished, cannot say that word, cherished possessions and his deepest motives and desires are inseparable. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. They will either both be earthly or both be heavenly. It is impossible to have one on earth and the other in heaven. As always, the heart, he says, must be right first. In fact, if the heart is right, everything else in life falls into proper place. The person who is right with the Lord will be a generous and happy in his giving to the Lord's work. By the same token, a person, he states, who is covetous, self-indulgent, and stingy has very good reason to question his relationship with the Lord. He says, Jesus is not saying that if we put our treasure in the right place, our heart will then be in the right place but that the location of our treasure indicates where our heart is already. Spiritual problems are always heart problems. Sinful acts come from a sinful heart, just as righteous acts come from a righteous heart, end quote there. And again, all those quotes are in the main show notes at the blog too, which is linked below the video. So, so in the previous verses, the you was plural, but now in verse 21 here, it's singular. It is you. Jesus is calling for each of us to make a personal application to the truths that he just taught us. Because he's stating in verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
And the word for heart here in the Greek is cardia, and it's referring to the whole inner man and to the core of our total being. When our hearts are focused on things above and not on things on earth, think Colossians 3 here, those first four verses, then we're going to find ourselves giving our time and resources to the eternal work of the Lord. Whatever we treasure here on earth is what is where most of our time and attention is going to be focused. Our heart is going to follow what we treasure. And material possessions, again, in and of themselves, they are not forbidden here. I, am, I need to be so clear on that. It's not wrong to be rich or to make provisions for your future and to care for your family. Joseph stored grain for future use, right? That's Genesis 41, 33 to 36. And Abraham, he was a pretty wealthy guy, Genesis 13, 2. Money can be a huge blessing, but only if it is not an end itself, but a means to an end. So our problem comes about when our thinking is selfish. Remember when we went to the singular here. So Jesus is telling us not to be selfish or self-centered and how we accumulate possessions as, as if it's our only purpose or our only goal in life. So friend, if all we value are things of and on earth, then we're going to find ourselves with earthly values. We're going to be of no use to the kingdom. When our goals and values are set on God's will and his purposes, then how we consider and use our possessions, it's going to reflect that. When our hearts are fixed on heaven, then we will hold with an open hand things of this earth. Warren Wearsby cautions, he says that if the heart loves material things and puts earthly gain above heavenly investments, then the result can only be a tragic loss. The treasures of earth may be used for God, but if we gather material things for ourselves, we're going to lose them and we'll lose our hearts with them. Instead of spiritual enrichment, we will experience impoverishment. We know where our treasure lies if we look at where we spend our time and money, really looking at the things that we're devoted to. Because my dear friend, we can know all about fashion and food and fitness and health and have all the latest gadgets and home decorating and, and nothing about those is wrong in and of themselves. But we need to ask ourselves the question, how much do I know about God's word? How much do I know about God or desire to know about him? How much time and energy do I put into reading and studying and meditating on the Bible? 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8 says, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. Out of our hearts and our actions, um, they, out of our hearts and actions come and they speak pretty loud as to what we treasure. So what we treasure could reveal a heart problem. And the next, Jesus is going to see if we have an eye problem. So let me read Matthew chapter 6, verses 22 to 23 next. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light to, in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Sinclair Ferguson affirms, he said, fixing the eye and fixing the heart amount to the same thing. He says, focusing our attention and concentrating all our energies on something. So how do we look at things? <clears throat> do we see with singular vision or double vision? What about how do we look at everything in the world? We always have two ways of looking at things. If we have a spiritual view, we're going to see things clearly and the way they're supposed to be. But if we have bad eyes, we're going to see with double vision. It's going to be blurry and the lens is probably going to need a good wiping off as my schmeary glasses usually do. So Jesus is still driving home the point that we need to have a singular, clear, focused mind, giving God our full attention and focus. Am I pounding that home enough? I think I am. These two words here used in verse 22 and 23 of clear and bad can be translated as clear, can be translated as for generous and bad for ungenerous. So we see a clear or a generous eye in James 1 and 5 and in describing one who gives generously to all. And then we see a bad or unrighteous eye in Proverbs 28, 22, with, where it says, a man with an evil eye hastens after wealth. So we're either being generous, right, with our possessions, or we're being stingy and we're coveting money and wealth. And this produces, as Jesus warns in our verses, darkness that is great. Our Kent Hughes stated here, he said, the idea here is simple but beautiful. He states, the eye is pictured as the window through which light comes into the body. If a window is clean and the glass is clear, the light that comes in will probably light every part of the room. 
But if the window is dirty or the glass is uneven or tinted or discolored, the light's going to be hindered and the room is not going to receive the full benefit of the light. He states the amount and quality of the light that comes into the room depends on the condition of the window through which it comes. So it is with the eye, he continues. The condition of the eye determines the quality of the light that enters the body. He says, if you're colorblind, all the reds and greens of Christmas decorations are lost to you. All And if you have cataracts, you may sit next to someone and perceive only a shadow. If your eye is blind, he states, how great is the darkness? There are no colors, no forms, no motion. Of course, Jesus is not giving us a lesson on optics. He's saying that the light that comes into a man's soul depends on the spiritual condition of the eye through which it has to pass because the eye is the window of the body. So wealth, it doesn't just enslave our hearts. It can enslave our minds and it will leave us with darkened eyes and divided hearts. If we find ourselves focused on what the world calls success, we're not going to be able to see clearly. It's going to be distorted and foggy and unclear, and it's going to block out God's light. Jesus is going to continue to hammer this point home in our next verse here. In Matthew 6, 24, it states, he says, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Okay, no one. That's pretty clear in our first two words in that verse. We will always be preferring one master over another, and they both make demands on our lives. God demands our full attention, and the world desires our full attention, right, or devotion. We tend to see more gray areas of life than there really are. We can tend to compromise and veer off that narrow path too often. God tells us in Deuteronomy 6, 5, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Not some, but all. So we had two treasures, two visions, and now we have two masters. Martin Lloyd-Jones stated, he said, the man who thinks he is godly because he talks about God and says he believes in God and goes to a place of worship occasionally, but is really living for certain earthly things, how great is that man's darkness? He told a story that it really gives us a good picture or summary of Jesus's point he's making to us in the text today. So this is really just a good story. He says, it's the story of a farmer who one day went happily and with great joy in his heart to report to his wife and family that their best cow had given birth to two twin calves, one red and one white. And he said, you know, I have suddenly had a feeling and impulse that we must dedicate one of these calves to the Lord. We'll bring them up together, and when the time comes, we'll sell one and keep the proceeds, and we'll sell the other and give the proceeds to the Lord's work. His wife asked him which he was going to dedicate to the Lord. He says, there's no need to bother about that now, he replied. We'll treat them both in the same way, and when the time comes, we'll do as I say. And off he went. And in a few months, the man entered his kitchen looking very miserable and unhappy. And when his wife asked him what was troubling him, he answered, I have bad news to give you. The Lord's calf is dead. But she said, you had not decided which was to be the Lord's calf. Oh, yes, he said. I had always decided it was to be the white one. And it is the white one that has died. The Lord's calf is dead. Martin Lloyd Jones says, we may laugh at that story. But he said how true it often is in our own lives that it is always the Lord's calf that dies. He said that maybe when money is tight, we cut back our giving to the church. And one point I want to bring us to as we come to a close is um, it's one that Martin Lloyd-Jones kind of ended with his studies in the Sermon on the Mount. Excellent resource. If you don't have it, it's, you know I recommend it every time, but it is just a great book to go through the Sermon on the Mount with. But he just brought out how often um, our Lord and the apostles warn us about these things. And the answer he gave is it is because of sin and the effect that sin has on our lives. We cannot lose sight of this, my friend, as believers. Sin is a serious issue in our lives, even after salvation. Sin causes us to be governed by our emotions and our desires. Our emotions and our desires can be good things when they're driven by truth, the truth of God's word, but so often we let them lead instead of God's word leading them. Also, this world and everything in it is passing away, so we need to not hold tightly to it and the things in it, right? We can too easily get caught up in the here and now, and we lose focus of eternity. And the reality is that we can't mix light and darkness. 
That's the reminder, again, that we can't serve two masters. These are absolutes. We can't love two opposite things at the same time. It's either one or the other. And I appreciate how Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones brought this section to a close. And I, I want you to hear this with me. Um, and this is, this is his words here. He says, if you're here with me now and you're not a Christian, you have not bowed the knee to King Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you have never come to the place to see yourself as a sinner against a holy God and repented and turned from your sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, then, then the doctor's words to you are, don't trust your mind, he says. You can't think rationally. Your mind is a dangerous thing and cannot be trusted. And he continues, but if you are a Christian, if you are known by and you know Jesus Christ, God in the flesh is your Lord and Savior, then your mind can now for once think rationally. Your mind can receive truth with the truth of God and who he is and your great need for him being the first truth that entered in it. So after receiving this truth of God in your mind, you can now think clearly. Your heart can be focused on the eternal and your eye is single focused. You love truth above all else and you seek it above all things. So I pray, my friend, that that we will all be those Christians who love God above all things and serve him and serve him alone and that we are single focused because Jesus truly is enough always. I'm so, so grateful for your time today, my friend. As always, always, the show notes have all the quotes and scripture references and resources. Anything I mentioned here will be over at the blog at thankfulhomemaker.com. It's linked below the video. If you get to my blog and you didn't get there through the link, just put in, um, put in the word treasures and you'll find it. It'll come up in the search engine. If you're enjoying your time here with me, I'd so appreciate it if you give a thumbs up to this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a video. I'm so glad to have you here with me. And I do pray, my dear friend, that you have a very blessed week.